things you got to be careful about. Things about careful, uh, things you have to be careful about when you're dealing with fisheries issues in general. Uh, let me preface all this by saying that fisheries is fundamentally a quantitative subject, right? It, it's, it's about how much we can catch, how many, that sort of thing. And so if you're going to be involved as a, in your career in fisheries in general, you have to come to a good understanding of the quantitative tools that are providing you or that you're, or that you're contributing to uh, the numbers that are really the basis for the policies that you may recommend, whether that's marine protected areas or anything else, uh, you got to understand the quantitative basis of the decisions that you're uh, advocating or uh, contributing to. Uh, now what happened here? Why am I not? Oh, okay, there it goes. Let me just a little preface here about fish stock collapses in general. I'm going to be talking about a series of uh, collapses that have occurred in British Columbia fish stocks here. There are some researchers, including a couple at UBC, that have urged you to believe that the main cause of fishery collapses historically has been overfishing. When stocks are gone down, it's because they fish too much. That assertion turns out to be false in general. Billy did an analysis a few years ago, and it was repeated at the University of Washington, showing that about 40% of the fish stock collapses that we can document pretty well through assessment methods and so on involved production collapses, biological collapses that preceded overfishing. So overfishing didn't cause the collapses. Overfishing may have occurred afterward, but wasn't the reason for the collapses in the first place. So it is not the main cause. Fishing is not the main cause of collapses around the world. It's about 50-50 fishing and other things. And I'm going to be showing you cases here, recent BC fish stock collapses, uh, that if you looked at them in terms of the statistics that people have used to urge you that collapse is due to overfishing, you would think would have been due to overfishing, but actually weren't. They were due to other changes. I'll be talking about uh, Pacific herring stocks, uh, Georgia Strait, Chinook and Coho salmon, and off cycle sockeye stocks. And, if there's a bit of time, I can talk about a couple other things like steelhead and, uh, and ulican stocks where we think exactly the same uh, problem has developed. Uh, I'll point out just one example from BC of a fish stock collapse that was due to overfishing, we all agree, and that was uh, an early collapse in uh, herring stocks back in the late 1960s. So it was just a a blatant example of overfishing, but that's actually that herring collapse is the only major example in British Columbia that we have of overfishing being the cause of a fish stock collapse. Okay, well, what, uh, what got me suspicious about the title of this talk about pinniped predation was a series of papers that came out from a, a, a DFO scientist named Peter Alicia who had devoted his career to developing censuses over the years of marine mammal abundances off the coast, particularly of uh, seals and sea lions. And Peter developed this really dramatic picture where he back calculated way back into the 1880s, how large the seal population and harbor seal population in BC had to have been in order to have sustained the, uh, the estimated number of seals that were culled or removed through commercial harvesting over the years. And this reconstruction, well, there's just been this huge population increase that occurred after the uh, Marine Mammal Protection Act, and that also occurred in uh, stellar sea lions. But one of the most interesting things to me was that the back calculation indicates that seals and sea lions back in the late 1800s were a lot less abundant than they are today. They have not recovered to natural levels. They have recovered from much lower levels. 
you realize that what's going on there is that uh, these uh, seals and sea lions were prized by First Nations people because of the high quality meat and other products that they got from them. And they've been intensively harvested along the British Columbia coast for thousands of years. So a return to natural off our coast actually would mean a return to much lower abundances than we have today. If by natural, you mean in the Anthropocene in the last several thousand years. Uh, by about 1880, the uh, First Nations populations of BC had been hit by two major smallpox epidemics and their harvesting and cultural systems had collapsed almost entirely. So uh, seal and sea lion populations were starting to build up at that time probably. Uh, may have been even lower than this 40,000, 50,000 number back uh, in the early 1800s when their uh, harvesting systems were intact. Anyway, they really knocked the seals down dramatically by the 1920s. There was a bit of a recovery, but to low levels. And then a commercial harvesting system in the late 1960s really knocked the seals way, way, way down. And then after closure, they build up dramatically. Uh, an interesting point is that uh, these are the long-term history of uh, commercial harvests of Chinook and coho salmon off the coast. Uh, based on where fisheries were occurring back in the, in the 1880 to 1920 period, there should have been a lot higher harvests, particularly in the Fraser River of Chinook and coho salmon than were observed. So we have a suspicion based on those old commercial statistics that the initial seal and sea lion reduction may have substantially benefited Chinook and Coho populations. Anyway, those, pop those populations and their catches remained quite high until the uh, 1990s when there was a severe reduction uh, in response to uh, observed declines in survival rates of the two species. Uh, that huge pinhead biomass out there today that is now consuming, oh, I should have, I forgot to make this point up here, that stellar sea lions eat a lot more than seals do. So even though their population is smaller, their total consumption of fish is much larger than what seals eat. Those sea lions are now consuming about 300,000 tons of fish a year, which is greater than all of the British Columbia commercial fisheries combined for all species of fish and salmon aquaculture production. So this sea lion population, it doesn't look very large right here, is actually having a huge impact on, on uh, mortality rates of a variety of fish species or could be having. That large pinniped biomass is supported largely by gadoids whose biomass is huge out there and for which the pinniped predation rate is very low. And by herring, for which the pinniped predation rate is variable. But the stocks that are being impacted most are Chinook coho salmon and juvenile salmon that are in some cases suffering really high mortality rates, even though they're only a tiny percentage of the pinniped diet. So this is a bad situation. You've got a big predator population that's supported by non-salmonid prey, and they, but they can remain abundant enough to have a high predation impacts on those less abundant prey types that they target at particular times a year, like during spawning migrations of herring and older salmon, as well as incidental mortality they cause on juvenile salmon by eating them when they run into them. Uh, we've tried to assess these pinniped impacts uh, in two main methods. One of them is a, just a statistical comparison of fish mortality rate measurements with changes in pinniped abundance, i.e. Uh, the pinniped number has been well correlated with space-time changes in mortality rates measured in various ways. And then we've uh, done direct calculations of possible predation mortality rates using prey abundance estimates and estimates of pinniped food consumption rates and diet compositions to just make sure that 
there are enough pinnipeds out there and they are eating enough to account for the measured mortality rate changes. So I'll only be showing you cases where uh, both of these conditions are satisfied. This is just a compar comparison uh, stands up and, uh, and uh, pinnipeds could have eaten enough to cause the mortality changes. Oops, now I gotta warn you here that when you do this kind of analysis, there are three things that can go wrong with it. The first thing is that uh, the mortality rate changes that I'll show you are also correlated with other factors that have exhibited long-term changes. So we've seen increasing water temperatures and changes in water current regimes and so on off the coast. There's just a warning here that correlation doesn't imply causality uh, in any fisheries analysis, even though we find people who would like to have you believe that the correlations they've found are causal. A second more important issue, particularly with juvenile salmon uh, mortality rates due to seal predation is that we can't be sure that the fish that the pinnipeds are eating wouldn't have died anyway. So it could be that factors like temperature and disease are causing these changes in behavior of these juvenile fish that make them vulnerable to pinnipeds. And those same factors could have caused them to die even if the pinnipeds hadn't eaten them. And that's called non-additive predation mortality. It's not an issue in a couple of the cases I'll talk about, uh, but it is an issue with juvenile uh, salmon mortality. Another thing working in the other direction is that predators can kill prey without eating them. They can cause much higher mortality rates than expected from the amounts they actually consume by uh, triggering a risk sensitive or ecology of fear foraging behaviors among the juvenile fish that cause those juveniles to exhibit poorer growth and survival rates. Essentially, juvenile fish having to make a choice between getting eaten and starving to death, and they'll try to balance that choice, and a lot more of them will starve to death when there's a lot more predators. You know, this, is a, this ecology of fear thing is a big issue today and generally in ecology. There have been interesting experiments, like uh, those experiments in ponds showing that uh, you can put uh, bass in ponds and they eat up all the, seem to eat up all the tadpoles in the ponds. You can put bass in a pond in cages so they can't eat any tadpoles and the, almost the same decline in tadpole abundance occurs because the tadpoles get too scared to come out and eat and they starve to death. There's a whole bunch of examples of where uh, predators can kill things uh, by driving behavioral changes in their prey that make the prey die due to other factors. So that's what mean we could be underestimating predation impacts, particularly on juvenile fish that have strong risk sensitivity in their foraging behaviors. So there's this long history, as you saw in the earlier pictures of uh, sustainable harvesting of uh, salmon in British Columbia. So these are the total catch statistics from about 1925. And then starting in the late 1980s, catches started to decline, reached, uh, reached a low by the late 1990s and remained low ever since. Much of the, that would be called a collapse. And many would attribute that collapse to uh, overfishing. But what actually, about half of the collapse here is because the percentage of fish actually harvested, the exploitation rates, were pulled way back at this time in the late 1990s. They were cut about in half. So about half of the decline that you see in the catches was because of DFO regulatory reductions in harvesting rates in response to what they perceived to be declining survival rates and declining abundances in several stocks. Now, in let me talk specifically about my favorite place in the whole world, which is our backyard. The Georgia Strait out here, uh, off the mouth of the Fraser, and I guess I don't have to tell you where the Georgia Strait is, right? It's, it's where we live. Uh, when I first came to uh, BC in 1969, 
Sport catches of Chinook and Coho were upwards of a million and a half fish a year being caught. And the fishing was wonderful. Uh, I went out all the time. I caught my first salmon right under the Lionsgate Bridge in July 1969. And I fished a lot for years and years after that. But over time, first Chinook and then later Coho started to exhibit declining abundances as evidenced by catch. And this was coincident with the beginnings of the buildup in, the sea, in seals and sea lion populations. Now, there's a thing we have with Chinook and Coho that we don't have for most fish stocks, and that is uh, every year since the mid 70s, we've been releasing hundreds of thousands of fish, mostly from hatcheries with uh, coated wire tags embedded in their noses. And we have a major program for recovering those coated wire tags in the fisheries and in the escapements. So we can use the coated wire tags to directly measure the survival rates of these salmon over their first year in the ocean. So the salmon are born in fresh water in hatcheries or in natural streams. They migrate into the ocean and in the case of Chinook and Coho spend a, a good proportion of their first year in inside waters like in the Georgia Strait. Some of the big Chinooks move out, a lot of the Coho stay. And so what we've seen from the coated wire tagging data was a decline in survival rates of these fish measured from coated wire tag returns that pretty closely parallels the increase in abundance of predators out in the system. So there's a bit of correlative evidence that marine mammals might have been involved in the declines. When the Georgia Strait decline first started, uh, I was working on the Georgia Strait with DFO scientists and we were trying to work out management policies. And uh, when the decline first started, we thought we were looking at a classic overfishing problem. And we recommended to DFO that they develop particularly restrictive measures for the sport fishery, which we saw being the major uh, killer of salmon in the Georgia Strait. So they started to bring in sport fishing regulations. Uh, they closed a commercial troll fishery in the Georgia Strait. They put in spot closures and size limits and so on and so on. All of these things intended to rebuild the stocks. And, but the stocks just kept going down despite these regulatory initiatives aimed at reducing fishing mortality rates. In the early 1990s, there was a DFO technician who uh, was a friend of Peter Elisiuk's and been watching Peter Elisiuk gather data on the seals and sea lions and was also an avid fisherman. And he said, there's bloody seals everywhere and they're nailing our salmon. This was a fellow named Wayne Harling. Most of us ignored Wayne. We searched for all kinds of explanations for these declines. We, one of the first things we blamed was hatcheries. There's this litany in BC about when you see a salmon stock decline, you go look for what we call the three H's. Habitat loss, hatchery impact on stocks, which can be negative because of competition with wild stocks, and then harvesting. So we first looked, thought harvesting was the problem. Then we, for a while, we thought maybe it was the big buildup in hatcheries that had done it. But hatcheries stopped growing by the mid 1980s and the survival rates just kept going down despite the hatcheries not growing in their impact. And habitat loss has not been a problem in the Georgia Strait over any of this period. Uh, we saw a lot of salmon habitat loss in uh, the southern British Columbia during the periods of urbanization in the late 1800s and early 1900s. But we can actually, using those coated wire tag data and escapement data, we can back calculate how many uh, Chinook and Coho smolts had to have gone to sea over this period. And uh, that number of smolts has not gone down. So habitat is most definitely not a problem. And with the severe fishery restrictions, we can't blame the decline on the fisheries. So it's got to be something else that's caused these populations to go down. 
Well, one thing, another thing is that uh, in the Georgia Strait, as the Chinook and Coho abundances declined, sport fishing effort dropped off dramatically. Sport fisheries typically show this kind of what we call numerical response to changing availability of prey. You know, nobody's very many fewer fishermen are going to go out fishing when there's very few fish than when there are lots of fish. So fishing effort has dropped by about 90%. This means that the economic benefits of the sport fishery have declined much more than you'd expect from just a decline in abundance of fish. The, the sport fishing effort has dropped by 90%. And the various economic activities uh, and jobs and so on around the Georgia State that derive from sport fishing have really had a dramatic collapse. This has particularly impacted small communities around the strait like Campbell River and so on, where uh, employment related to sport fishing has been a big part of their economy or was a big part of their economy. But also because sport fisheries do show these dramatic effort responses, we don't expect sport fisheries to overexploit stocks very, very often. You know, the stock starts to go down and if they are overexploiting it, their effort will drop off their mortality impact will drop off and the stock will have a chance to recover. Okay, so the effort did drop off, but the stocks didn't recover. So it wasn't, definitely wasn't sport fishing effort to cause the collapse. When we plot the mortality rates, uh, M we call them, the M is called the natural mortality rate in fisheries, the instantaneous natural mortality rate in population ecology. Uh, as those we calculate it from those survival rates that I showed you earlier, there's an almost perfect linear relationship for both Chinook and Coho aggregated over stocks between the mortality rate and seal abundance calculated from interpolation between the observed seal abundance uh, data points. And the slope of this mortality rate curve is just about exactly what we calculate it should be from estimates of the number of juvenile fish consumed. Okay, so there's strong correlative evidence and that evidence uh, is supported by a prediction of what the mortality rate should be based on how much we calculate the seals to have eaten. So we satisfy both of the criteria I mentioned at the start of the talk that their correlation is strong and they're eating enough to have caused, the, apparently eating enough to have caused the decline. Let's, when we look at this on a stock by stock basis, because we have these survival rate, mortality rate estimates for a lot of stocks, they're very consistent for coho, whether it's wild or hatchery and different hatchery stocks around the Georgia Strait have all shown the same basic increasing mortality rate. But for Chinooks, when we look at them on a stock by stock basis, we don't see such a clear relationship. And in fact, uh, for Fraser River Chinook stocks, we don't see a clear statistical relationship at all. So it's only when we aggregate over all of the Chinook stocks that we can uh, see a, an overall pattern that's uh, apparently consistent. So uh, in recent years, we've developed models that propose uh, pinniped harvesting to reduce the Georgia Strait seal population by about 50% and then hold it at that level, which would be able to sustain harvests from by uh, First Nations people if they were the ones that did the harvesting and so on. And we've, uh, we've done population modeling fitting to historical data fitting the models to historical data and then projecting forward with those reduced mortality rate estimates to show that the catches would not recover to what they were historically, but they'd recover partway with the seal population still at half of its high abundance. The catches would not recover. Uh, escapements would recover quite a lot and sport fishing effort, the economic values from the sport fishery would recover to about half of what they were, we predict. So the proposals now for uh, trying to actively manage seal populations in the Georgia Strait region are not proposals for getting rid of them or anything like that. Uh, they uh, would generate modest 
uh, economic and, and uh, recreational benefits. Uh, one thing that people have argued is that we should go and kill what they call problem seals in estuaries. So uh, seals come into the estuaries. Some seals move into estuaries at the time when salmon return to spawn. And they very visibly and obviously eat a lot of spawning fish before they have a chance to go up to their spawning areas. And so one argument is we should call just those so-called problem seals that target salmon. That won't, that won't work. Uh, mortality rate estimates from monthly sampling of, uh, of seal stomach contents and predation rate estimates based on those show that the uh, juvenile salmon uh, consumption is not just at the time when they're going to see about in April here, but it, it's spread out over the whole summer. And the daily mortality rates caused by uh, seal predation are actually are higher in mid to late summer and into the fall than they are back at the time when, uh, when, when uh, seals, uh, one of the times when seals concentrate around the stream mouths. So this problem seal culling argument is a lose-lose policy. It would be hugely unpopular with the public. Uh, and it wouldn't solve the problem. I think this is an example of misdirection. This idea of culling problem seals uh, came from people who I don't think want there to ever be a, a harvest of seals. They know it, it wouldn't sell publicly. Uh, no, uh, so that, that's story number one, where the evidence is fairly strong that predation is at least the proximate cause of mortality and where our argument has been that we need to test this question of additive mortality. The only way we can resolve that question is to reduce the seal numbers and see if survivals improve as we expect. So we would have to do a big adaptive management experiment in the Georgia Strait to find out whether the models are correct. We can't tell just by collecting more descriptive data whether the models are correct in their predictions without doing the experiment. Well, let me turn to uh, sockeye salmon. Uh, this talk originally and the ones I've done for 520 in previous years have just been about Fraser River sockeye and its management history. I've been working on sockeye since I came to BC in 1969, collaborating with the Pacific Salmon Commission and DFO scientists over the years. So I, I follow the, the sockeye quite closely from year to year. The Fraser River sockeye is this amazing production system. It's not just one stock of fish. There's about a hundred different stocks of, uh, of sockeye. They all, most of them share the idea that they spawn in lakes like Chilco Lake up in the interior, or Quinell Lake and uh, Shuswap Lake. Uh, they spawn most, mostly in the tributaries to the lakes. The juveniles usually spend about a year in the lakes. And then they migrate downstream to the ocean and move rather rapidly through the coastal waters and then spend their ocean time out in the Gulf of Alaska. Then they come back to spawn, migrating back through into the Johnson and Juan de Fuca Straits and into the river. And these uh, biological stocks are really distinct from one another. For example, the the stocks that spawn way up here in the northern end of the system come in about a month and a half earlier than the stocks that spawn down in the lower part of the system. They need to spawn much earlier up in that upper part because the streams they spawn in freeze solid. So what happens is the fish that spawn way up in here, the eggs hatch and the fry move down into the gravel to avoid being frozen. And they hold down in the deep gravels for a couple of months before they can emerge and come back out in the springtime. So there are all these life history adaptations to environmental conditions that differ drastically over the system and uh, generated all these different life history types of sockeye. It's fascinating ecology, a fascinating example of local adaptation and evolution. And we very much want to try to preserve that biodiversity if at all possible. 
So we have uh, another reason for looking at the Fraser is that we have uh, catch statistics that go back, back to the 1880s. So from the 1880s till about 1913, the Fraser River had this violent cyclic harvest of sockeye salmon. There was one big year every four years, and then three low years, and then a big year and a low year. Salmon have a four-year life cycle. So the big years are produced by big spawning populations, and the low years are produced by low spawning populations. So there is a basic effect of spawning stock size on abundance. But something that we still don't completely understand has prevented these, what we call off-cycle low runs from recovering to the same abundances as the peak runs. There's some biology involved there in the interaction between the year classes of salmon, probably in fresh water. That means that when you have a big year, one year, the lake won't be able to produce as many sockeye juveniles the next year. Well, the carrying capacity is changing. In 1913, the Hell's Gate slide occurred here up in the Fraser Canyon, and it decimated pretty much all of the major salmon stocks. And the, so salmon runs were very, very low. But if you watch here, the runs slowly recovered through the 1970s to reach what appeared to have been half of their historical abundance by the 1990s. But actually, they, before the, the collapse, all the runs came back in the same dominant year. After the collapse, they came back in two different dominant years. So this is actually, when, if they'd all come back in the same year, these are as high, these abundances are as high as they were before the Hell's Gate collapse. Then coming into the 1990s, we started to see this disturbing decline. The peak years are still fairly high, although they're even there declining. But the off-cycle runs, the low abundance years, have been radically lower than they have ever been uh, since uh, the Hell's Gate disaster. And the low lines are going down faster than the big lines. Here's an interesting tidbit for you here about what we mean when we talk about overfishing. Over most of this period of decline, uh, I mean, of recovery of the Fraser River stocks, they were actually being technically overfished while they were recovering. That is, the exploitation rates were up around 70 to 80% over most of the recovery period. And the optimum exploitation rates for these stocks are about 60 to 65%. So these stocks were recovering while being overfished. Speaks to the dramatic resilience of, of sockeye salmon as a population. It also speaks to the need to be careful about what you mean when you talk about overfishing. Overfishing doesn't mean that things are collapsing. It doesn't mean that fish are gonna disappear. It means that they are being exploited at higher rates than the rates which would produce the largest value to people. Fair enough. We just published, Billy and I particularly published, and Murdoch published this paper about looking at the possibility that stellar sea lion predation was involved in particularly the declines of the recent years of the off cycle, low number sockeye runs. Because what we did, we, we looked at one of Peter Elisiak's maps of stellar sea lion abundances along the BC coast. These are maps or the circles are proportional to the total abundance of stellar sea lions on major rookeries off the coast. The biggest single stellar sea lion rookery area on the whole coast out of Triangle Island off the north end of Vancouver Island is right in the major migration path of sockeye salmon coming in from the North Pacific and go splitting to go around Vancouver Island on both sides to get into the, uh, the Georgia Strait and the Fraser River. So sitting right in the middle of their migration pathway is a, a highly efficient predator and very high abundance, capable of eating an awful lot of fish over a short period of time. Especially fish like sockeye that are concentrated in schools making it easy for uh, the predator to uh, find these schools and to 
obtain high feeding rates, uh, uh, even when total school sizes aren't that large. So we did a bunch of calculations. Uh, based on the trend data in sea lion abundances and some guesses at possible diet compositions of sea lions during that period when, when the sockeye are migrating past the big rookeries. And we concluded that stellar sea lion predation mortality rates now could be higher than the fishery mortality rates, particularly on the off cycle runs uh, to the Fraser. Because they can hit the off cycles a lot hard. We'll talk about that in a minute. They can hit, they can't do anything to a big, huge. If there's 10 million sockeye coming in past them around the mouth of the Johnson Strait, they're not going to cause any significant impact. But they can have a big impact on a much smaller off cycle return going through the same area. Carl, uh, go back again. You have to mention the Cohen Commission. Oh, why do I have to mention the Cohen Commission? Oh, come on, 2009. Oh. Well, there was, as the sake started to decline and the fishery was being cut back, there was a, a commission of inquiry, a public commission. We do these in Canada whenever we don't know what to do about some problem about the sake salmon decline called the Cohen Commission, where they brought in experts from all manner of areas of research and biology to and along with fishermen and the government to try to figure out what had caused this collapse and what ought to be, what they saw as a collapse and what ought to be done about it. And uh, Vili was in charge of looking at possible predation impacts at that time. And we didn't think about the uh, concentration problem. So the Cohen Commission concluded that predation impacts probably weren't that severe. Is that a fair appraisal? Yeah, but what, what, what we weren't thinking about was this business here, that we can be talking about high impacts over a short period of time on highly concentrated fish during a migration. And that wasn't, that wasn't part of the Cohen Commission thinking or analysis. Uh, one stock we have juvenile abundance data on juvenile numbers actually going to sea, and we have direct estimates of their marine mortality rate. And what we find for them is that that the Choco stock, that the marine mortality rate is positively correlated with sea lion abundance, like we see with uh, Chinook and Coho. But more importantly, when the ratio of uh, stock return stock size to sea lion abundance is uh, is low when there's a lot of sea lions around for each salmon that's returning. The marine mortality rate has gone way up in Choco Sakai. This increase in mortality rate at low stock size is called depensatory mortality in ecology and ecological research. Now, we have just to warn you, we can't be sure because these are measured. Mortality rates are measured from the time the fish leave their Choco Lake till they get back as adults. So this depensatory mortality could have occurred actually when they were still in the Fraser River before they even got to the ocean. So there's big uncertainty in any analysis like this. When you're looking over a large part of the fish's life cycle. Now this depensation is a major concern for fish population dynamics in general and particularly for small pelagics that I'll talk about next, and for sockeye salmon. Uh, depends, the meaning of depensatory mortality is that the proportion of fish that are killed by a mortality agent goes up when their abundance is low. So mortality rate is how many are eaten divided by the number at risk. So if the, num the number eaten may stay the same, but if the number at risk goes way down, the percentage mortality rate of those fish goes way up. And it's the percentage mortality rate that determines sustainability of the population, not the absolutely no number eaten. And this business of the number eaten staying high can happen in particular when predators can eat an almost constant number of prey from a declining prey resource. And this happens particularly when prey are highly concentrated or aggregated like during spawning runs of herring 
and salmon. Uh, this concern about uh, depensatory mortality triggered us to look at the next case study I want to examine, which is uh, BC herring stocks. The BC herring history here, just briefly, is that uh, the herring fishery built up from the early 1900s more or less steadily as a reduction fishery uh, for fertilizer and so on. In, in the uh, 1960s, it reached a peak where they were, uh, in the early fishery, they fished mainly larger herring in spawning schools coming around the coast to spawn. Later on, they shifted to targeting uh, juvenile herring as well. So they were fishing uh, herring that hadn't had a chance to spawn. And that fishery collapsed dramatically. This was classic overfishing. So they shut the fishery down and the stock started to recover. And then they rebuilt the fishery as a row fishery targeting uh, only spawning fish with high price row for uh, Japanese uh, markets. So this uh, row fishery, even though it was much smaller tonnage wise, was much more lucrative than the historical reduction fishery had been. So this uh, graph was produced, I was in 1980 and Al Hurston, uh, old, we call him Mr. Herring, who did a lot of the early herring research said, oh yeah, we're, we're in good shape. Things have recovered and we're gonna have a sustainable row fishery at low exploitation rates into the future. Okay, well, it didn't work out that way. Uh, and now uh, I need to show you some kind of nasty details here. Uh, let me ask you to focus first on this map of the BC coast. This map has uh, circles here showing where uh, Peter Lysiak's winter surveys showed uh, concentrations of stellar sea lions uh, during winter time, okay? And so you see they're concentrated in this area, this area, this area, and then down here on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Okay, then also here, are outlined the uh, boundaries of what we call the major herring stocks, the major spawning areas for herring. So one of them is up here around Prince Rupert. Another is off the east coast of Haida Gwaii in Charlotte's. Another one is in the central coast. It was never really, it was always a very erratic fishery, but uh, it was always part of the commercial fishery. Then, uh, there's a major fishery uh, for herring on the west coast of Vancouver Island that the biggest fishery for herring on the coast, uh, representing about half of the total catch, is in the Strait of Georgia. What made us start thinking about predation impacts is that the largest herring stock here is also the only area of the coast where there are not large wintering populations overwinter populations of stellar sea lions. It's the only place on the coast where stellar sea lions don't follow the herring in to their uh, spawning areas in uh, February, March, and April, and very visibly and obviously target them while they're spawning. Fair enough. So herring are distributed widely through the ocean through most of the year and the juveniles through all of the year. And even for the Georgia Strait herring migrate, juveniles migrate out onto the west coast here and do most of their rearing out in the outside waters. The herring then start to form spawning aggregations when they're about four years old. They move into the coast and they spawn in areas, very dense aggregations on uh, kelp beds and rocky bottoms against the shore. And this is where these winter rook, uh, uh, sea lion aggregations form to target those herring. Same thing happens all up the coast in Alaska and so on. There's lots of neat stories about the biology of stellar sea lions and their ability to target prey aggregations like herring uh, as they vary as, as variable opportunities over time. 
Now, uh, Murdoch, we're at 9.50. Did you want to take a break at this point, give the kids a break, or so we can split the lecture in half, or do you want me to continue for a few more minutes? Murdoch? Earth to Murdoch, unmute yeah, your- Yeah, okay, just unmuting here, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah I think, uh, let's say, how many minutes? Like, is five minutes enough for you to go and get your smoke? Or- um, or drink or whatever you need come back or do you want 10 minutes oh five minutes is five minutes for okay the old man so i would appreciate a little break at this point yeah it's, okay. it's not just the smoke it's uh, at my <laughs> age the potty becomes a serious issue so okay. i'll be back in five minutes and we'll continue this story uh okay. if you don't have anything to do and you just want to sit there you might try to look at these pictures these complicated pictures let me actually before i break uh for each of these stocks here, there's a time series pattern showing the uh, survey spawning stock abundances for the stock and our calculated mortality rates due to the, what we estimate the abundance of sea lions to have been uh, in those wintering areas as the sea lion populations build up. So in each case, you can see either a spawning stock time that didn't decline, in some cases, even more mortality rates went up, uh, other cases where the decline in spawning stocks was coincident with big increases in mortality and, and so on. So take a look at those pictures before I come back. Five minutes. I see Aaron Rachinsky down there. Are you uh, are you still there or are you, have you run out for a break? Maybe you're out for a break. I see Joy Thorkerson. How's it going, Joy? Maybe you're out for a break as well. No, I'm just muted. Okay. How are things up in Prince Rupert? Oh, well, as I look out the window, the trees are sideways. So it's a big storm. It's a rain warning and a storm warning. So yeah. I, how's the water advisory? Has it come off? I don't know. The ferry is not traveling today. So I doubt it. I doubt the water advisory is off because... When it blows in Rupert like this, it's got to be snotting out in the uh, ocean. Yeah, but there was the drinking water advisory. Oh, the drinking water. No, well, that'll stay on all winter. Oh, no. Gee. No, that, that's, we, that's really we, bad. I didn't even know it had gone off. So I was surprised that it went on again. What happens is that um, uh, we have so many slides into our drinking water. It's caused by... by um, uh, when we get huge rain events and uh, the, um, the watershed is, has always been unstable, but um, I don't know why we get more, more rain events right now, uh, or, if it, or if it's just the rain events. Um, I mean, it doesn't seem to me to be any more rainy in Rupert than when I moved here. So uh, and that was in the 70s. So I, I'm not quite sure, but they blame it on slides going into um, into into the lake, and and it could be that um, we're still taking water. We have two lakes, 
uh, Woodworth and Schwatlands and and Schwatlands is our uh, I can't remember which one is our main water supply but right now we're we're uh, doing a bunch of um, um, remediation to the dam and and to we're putting in a new pipe and so it could be that we're taking our water supply from the other uh, lake uh, which which um, you know which might be at, prone to having more slides but yeah it's just it's just the you get too much debris in our uh, water system and that's when the water advisory goes on and that work uh, that maintenance work could could take a while to to get sorted out so you're, you're left with having to take water from the uh, lake with the slides yeah and uh, um, it, it, it's sort of sort of it's not it, not as bad as Port Ed water was years and years and years ago, which was, um, I mean, totally brown in color, like tea. Uh, they've, they've got their water filtration, new water filtration plant in about 10 years ago or so. But um, ours is, ours looks clear when you run it, but if you, you know, you look inside your, your white toilet bowl, you can certainly see color. So lots of scrubbing of toilets. Oh, yeah, that's a great inconvenience to have to always boil the water you're going to use to, for drinking, whatever, whatever. Wow. Every, everybody is just buying water. We, we oh, buy okay. water for straight drinking, and then it's the mildest of well water advisories, so we don't have mm -hmm. to. It's only a, like, a, I think it's three minutes they advise, and um, we've had them where they had to be 10 minutes, but um yeah, it's just three minutes, minutes of, of boiling. So I boil all my water that I'm going to, you know, like for coffee or something like that, where I can, I can mask the taste, but uh, just for drinking water, just regular drinking water, just to drink, I, uh, we buy bottled water, you know, not, you know, big tubs of bottled water, not bottles of water. But who should buy buying water in Canada? Nobody should have to buy water. <laughs> And that this is not a one-off thing. You, you, it happens on a regular basis, I guess, up in Prince Rupert. Well, more, more, um, really, in, since we started um, uh, trying to upgrade our dam and um, and water delivery system, um, probably happened before, but I can't really remember it happening before. You know, we 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 um, have huge um, a huge water delivery system. System. In, in all our pipes are very large because we had all the large fish plants who use a lot of water. And now with the fish plants, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, gone from Prince Rupert, uh, of all the sad things, uh, the, um, the water volume is way down. And so uh, areas um, which have huge pipe volumes have very small amounts of water running through them. And so then uh, we tend to, uh, we have to flush a lot uh, to try to keep those pipes clean. So sometimes there's boiled watery advisories right around the, the flushing of pipes. When, when we used to be, you know, have lots of fish plants in town, the fish plants, I mean, they were built to service fish plants. They weren't built to service our community. They're like the, the residents. So anyway, that that's, you know, it's a problem of aging in infrastructure and infrastructure, but, you know, built for a period that probably will never. Oh, good morning, dear Joy. Yeah. I don't think we'll be looking at. Hi, Carl. How are you, girl? Oh, wouldn't I would not want to be living in Rupert these days. Oh, it's yeah. it's it's pretty pretty sad. I mean, the cannery has mm. gone. The Canadian Fish told us you see in negotiations they have no intention of processing in Prince Rupert anymore just an unloading station. We've gone from employees when, you know, at, at, the, at the peak of, of my career anyway, in the, in the 80s, when we had uh, 1,200 people on, um, mm -hmm. on one plant seniority list and, and probably mm -hmm. 300 people at another plant seniority list and another 200 people at another plant seniority list, you know, Canadian Fish merged all those plants into one plant reduced mm -hmm. the workforce to 750 and then in 2015 it plummeted to you know we have 30 people employed mm -hmm. 
So oh, that's such a sad very story. Sad. Look, I got to get going on this lecture again. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 Murdoch and I were chatting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me, uh, let me just preface the startup of this lecture again, that if you're in the Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries, it's an institute about fisheries. It's not an institute about fish. It's not about fish conservation. It's about sustaining fisheries. And fisheries are about not just fish, they're about fish and people. And when you talk to somebody like me, I'm every bit as concerned about the people, like the people here in Prince Rupert and their futures as I am about the bloody fish. Right? Sustaining fish is easy. You just stop fishing like BFO is doing up and down the coast and you'll sustain the fish unless the marine mammals or something eat them all. But the important thing is to try to sustain these coastal communities and that's not being done through current policies in any of the BFO fisheries. Okay, let me continue here. So you see this really complex picture and you can look at it on your own time. One of the main reasons to show it to you is to show you that we analyzed a huge amount of herring time series data and uh, sea lion abundance data in order to conclude that uh, predation impacts on a couple of these uh, fishing areas, particularly the central coast, Haida Gwaii, and most importantly, the west coast of Vancouver Island uh, have been severely impacted by uh, sea lion predation. Uh, these areas that were severely impacted have had their uh, fisheries have been basically closed since the early 2000s. Right? So nobody can claim that overfishing is the cause of those collapses or that uh that if they hadn't kept fishing the stocks would have recovered they're not recovering despite almost complete fishery closures or not re completely recovered uh how do we know that the natural mortality rates of herring meaning what we think are mainly due to predation uh have actually gone up. Well, that's real simple. One of the things they do in the herring assessments every year is they assess over the years, they assess the age composition of the spawning fish. And these gray bands basically show how many age classes are contributing to the fishery each year. And when you get uh, a, an area that hadn't collapsed much, like Prince Rupert or the Georgia or the Georgia Strait, the, a wide range of ages of fish contribute to the fishery. And the age composition of the, of the spawners hasn't changed much. But when you get to the west coast of Vancouver Island, what you see is an almost complete disappearance of older fish from the stock. So that almost all during this period of real low abundance in the uh, west coast of Vancouver Island, almost all of the spawners were four or five years old. And there were very few six, seven, eight, nine-year-old spawners. So we're looking at direct mortality rate estimates uh, from age composition data and concluding that something is causing a lot higher herring mortality and the near collapse of those stocks. When we plot the uh, change in mortality rate that we calculate from the age composition data, to the predicted sea lion predation rates based on sea lion numbers using each area and total number, total biomass of herring spawning, herring spawners at risk to predation. What we find is a very strong correlation between the apparent increase in mortality rate. So we measure from age data and the direct prediction of mortality rate from sea lion abundance consumption and herring biomass. So we have both spatial and temporal evidence that sea lion predation has uh, been a significant factor in the decline of these st uh, herring stocks in the areas where the declines were severe. Uh, 
fortunately, we are starting to see recoveries in, uh, in all of the areas that, that showed severe collapses. Uh, spawning stock sizes are starting to come back. Uh, and that's an encouraging sign, but they're coming back under essentially no fishing. So the recovery of these spawning stocks is no indication that those areas are going to be able to sustain fisheries again. Uh, now, basically, what was fisheries yield is now going into uh, sea lion consumption. So the sustainable fisheries opportunities are much lower in those areas than they were despite the spawning stock recoveries. Now, uh, let me just turn to a different question here. Why, have, why hasn't DFO noticed these things, these examples that I just showed you? Why haven't they uh, considered predation impacts in, in policy planning for these fisheries? Well, I think there's three main reasons for this. One of them is there's a lack of objectivity in the, in the DFO science. Training has thought, taught a lot of uh, DFO scientists to look mainly for bottom-up effects. So when they see something declining, what they look for is something wrong with its food supply, something wrong with the climate that's causing the stock to decline. They don't even look at other possibilities like top-down predation effects. They don't even look for those effects. Uh, others seem willing to entertain predation as an issue, but they don't seem to be able to do the calculations that you need in order to evaluate possible predation impact. They don't seem to be able to do the, how many predators are there? How much do they eat each? And what does that mean as a total mortality? And then uh, there are people who have long-standing personal commitments to particular hypotheses for decline in populations, like increasing water temperature and so on like that. Who, uh, and I think these people actually feel threatened by anybody suggesting that their hypothesis might be wrong. Another, another issue is cautious management. Uh, when proposals have come forward to do kind of fed abundance reduction, there's been very visible and obvious fear of strong uh, negative reaction from the public, from the organized by environmental NGOs that seem to be pretty severely misinformed about predation, possible predation impacts. Uh, there's also a fear of failure because when we talk about uh, pinniped reduction in terms of our science and our modeling, we say, well, because of non-additive predation issues, we're not sure that you're going to get a positive response if there is a pinniped reduction. We talk about management as an experiment, and there's a, a justifiable fear that the experiment won't work and they'll get eggs on the egg on their faces. And then another big reason is that uh, they uh, DFO has a real way of passing the buck. They can and do endless scientific reviews and endless. Uh, and, and endless consensus development and endless observation and substitute that for any kind of uh, effective action. They can keep delaying action. Uh, this is a common issue in fisheries management in general when managers are faced with hard choices like whether to cut back fisheries or whether to control predators or whatever. Inaction is often the fishery manager's best choice is to do nothing and hope the problem will go away on its own. And then uh, there are a fairly large number of DFO people I know personally who have serious personal eth ethical concerns about killing marine mammals in general. And, and that very obviously colors their uh, policy recommendations uh, and recommendations about whether even to do research that, on possible predation impacts. So. I'll just mention that in passing. So in terms of the, the uh, policy, or the data that I've just shown you, uh, suggesting that maybe pinnipet abundances ought, might ought to be reduced, there's 
DFO has three basic policy options. One of them is just to say we can't deal with this for either ethical or public concerns or whatever. So we'll just adopt radically precautionary harvest policies. We'll shut down the Georgia Strait salmon fishery in 1997 and keep it closed as long as we have to till the stocks come back, if they come back. So they can try to use harvest management to deal with a problem that isn't caused by harvesting in the first place. Uh, they can take the opposite extreme, which is to go ahead and say these marine mammals are just like any uh, unregulated fishery. The fishery has been allowed to build up over time without management and we need to manage it just like we manage other fisheries and they can introduce things like culling to uh, reduce the number of license holders in that fishery, if you like. Reduce the number of marine mammals that are allowed to impact the fisheries, the fish stocks. That would be a hugely unpopular choice uh, in the largely urban population of British Columbia, at least, for all the reasons that people like marine mammals and don't like fishermen because they're rapacious, horrible, uh, people that just want to destroy the fish stock. So why do you want to, why do you want to kill all these pretty little marine mammals and cute things just to save a bunch of rapacious fishermen? A third option that's being pressed is to uh, restore the First Nations marine mammal harvesting system to something like it was uh, pre-contact, as both a uh, subsistence harvesting system and also a commercial harvest where there are some potentially quite high values of uh, seals and sea lions for their hides and for uh, omega-3 fatty acid oils. Uh, seals are very high in omega-3 fatty acids, it turns out, so they're a great source of omega-3 fatty acids. The uh, current proposals out there for restoring the First Nations marine mammal system are actually only talking about doing it as a, a First Nations harvesting in order to avoid public outcry about a call. So the guys that are promoting this First Nations harvesting system aren't really thinking about any long-term benefits to First Nations people. They're really just talking about uh, keeping the public outcry down about culling and uh, maybe covering the costs of culling uh, uh, through some limited income to First Nations people. So DFOs adopted this first strategy with closures all up and down the coast. And uh, that culling strategy is an extremely unpopular and, and unnecessary choice. And there's proposals that DFO has been sitting on for a couple of years now to restore First Nations harvesting. This is actually starting to occur. First Nations people have the right to get personal permits to harvest up 15 or so uh, seals and sea lions each. And uh, a lot of uh, First Nations people are exercising those rights now and are going out and starting to do harvests on their own. And uh, you know, for places like the Georgia Strait, it's not more data that we need to resolve the uncertainties if that's important from a, a policy point of view. So it's gonna to have to be done as an experiment. Okay, so that, that concludes uh, the core of the lecture that I plan to give you. And what I'm gonna do now is talk about a few extra things that are uh, on the one time they're kind of fun to talk about and then uh, in at least one case, a warning to you about watching out for just really inept analysis. And I'll hope to finish this up in about 15 minutes. So there'll be plenty of time for uh, questions. I'm sure lots of you have questions after the dust talk. First little bit here is population dynamics theory. If you... Uh, look across different biomass levels for a fish stock like herring. Uh, a, a necessary condition for a sustainable fishery to exist is that the population growth rate, if they aren't harvested, has to go up at low stock sizes. There has to be what we call compensatory increase in productivity of the stock as it's reduced by fishing 
in order for fishing to be sustained, if this compensatory improvement in uh, population growth rate or survival doesn't occur, the fishery will just keep progressively reducing the stock and, and until it's gone. Fair enough. So the classic theory of fishing for sustainable fisheries assumes this dotted line that when you fish a stock down, it's going to become more productive. But in the presence of depensatory mortality, like I talked about earlier, that compensation only works down to a moderate stock size. And then below that stock size, you actually get decreasing population growth rate due to depensation until you get really ne possibly negative population growth rates. This is called a predator pit. And then a very low population sizes, the predators don't target them anymore. And then the population growth rate can, can become positive again. When you have this complex response due to predation, a population can have three equilibrium points. One where it's trapped at a low level by the depensatory predation impacts combined with predator switching. One at an intermediate level where if abundance gets a little bit higher, there'll actually be positive growth and the population can build up again. And then an upper level that where there's sustainable fishing opportunities and so on. So these three equilibria represent a healthy situation, an unstable point, and a really low critical population size where there's all sorts of conservation risks, like extinction of very small populations of uh, coho salmon that's occurring in the Georgia Strait. If I turn this graph on its side and I plot just these equilibrium points of herring biomass, the equilibrium points, if there's no sea lions around, you get this compensatory re response thing where as fishing mortality rate goes up, we expect a smooth decline in the fish population towards extinction. But when there's sea lions in the system at a moderate abundance, building up the fishery, fishing mortality rates, causes a smooth population response at first, but then the upper equilibrium point disappears and there's a rapid collapse down to the low population size. And when that happens, you have to reduce the fishing mortality rate a lot before the population can start to recover again as is, as is occurring with herring. This pattern where you have this folded equilibrium structure and a cliff edge where sudden collapses can occur if either the predators become more abundant or fishing mortality rate goes up, either of those can cause a, an, an abrupt stock collapse to a low level that'll persist for at least some time. This pattern of population response is called the cusp catastrophe structure in population dynamics. And whenever it's present, whenever depensation can have, can cause the population to respond in a complicated and way with abrupt shifts between equilibrium points or multiple stability domains, is much more difficult to manage than a situation where the population is assumed or will respond smoothly. So over most of the 20th century, when we had low stellar sea lion abundances and so on, we could manage herring and salmon by varying the fishing mortality rates so as to maintain relatively high equilibrium abundances of salmon and herring and other things. But in this world where there's a lot of marine mammals out there, we our safe operating range for fishing mortality is much narrower before we hit this cliff edge and this collapse can occur. And we have to take radical action. It may involve not only fishery closures, but may involve having to do marine mammal reductions and fishery closures to trigger a release. We think this cusp catastrophe structure is one of the main reasons why pelagic fish stocks around the world are notorious for displaying what they call regime shifts in their biology. 
they go from high abundance regimes to low abundance regimes to high abundance, and there'll be a high, a high abundance regime for 10 or 20 years. There'll be a collapse. There'll be a low abundance for 20 years or so, and then build back up the high regime. We think this basic cusp catastrophe model is the basic explanation for why this uh, violent variation is a characteristic of most uh, uh, of most populations of small pelagics. It, recently, we've seen one really sad collapse here on the BC coast is uh, uh, under relatively low fishing mortality rates, but with the buildup in marine mammals, we've seen a virtually complete collapse of ulican populations along the BC coast. Uh, ulicans are anadromous. They spawn in rivers like the Fraser. The juveniles go out to outside waters like the herring do for two years, and then they come back and move up the river and spawn and die. They do so in April. And every April, when they come into the spawning areas, come into the mouth of the Fraser, a big aggregation of stellar and California sea lions forms at the mouth of the river. And that aggregation causes a predation gauntlet uh, through which the the uh, the ulican stock can only survive in good numbers if the stock is at a high level in the first place. Any environmental thing that causes the ulican stock to drop a bit will get it into this domain where the predation mortality rate that wouldn't have been important if it if that stock had been larger will drive the ulican stock down towards near zero. A whole bunch of our Ulican stocks along the BC coast are, are apparently down near zero and haven't recovered. Fortunately, the Fraser Ulican, the biggest Ulican stock on the coast is, is recovering and with the, roughly the same kind of pattern that herring stocks have with complete fishery closures and so on. So you wanna, be aware of this, this multiple equilibrium model. I think you're going to see it play a larger role in designing ecosystem management policies for marine fisheries in general. Uh, and you're going to see a lot more emphasis on management regimes that deal with top down uh, predation effects along with fishing mortality rate effects. I want to show you one example here of what I consider to be complete bloody scientific incompetence. There's a paper coming out this month in uh, Fisheries, the American Fisheries Society magazine by two uh, prominent uh, DFO scientists. And they show you some data collected over the period from 2002 and 2017 on the Georgia Strait. And uh, Beamish is and Neville have been conducting uh, juvenile abundance surveys out in the Georgia Strait for the last, over this period. And what they do is they plot their juvenile abundance index in different years, high index in some years, low index of juvenile abundance in other years, against the escapement of, of fish that occurs the next year to uh, some of the salmon coho salmon spawning streams around the Georgia Strait. And they assert that this lack of relationship between how many juveniles are in there in the fall and how many subsequently escape to spawn, and most of these aren't harvested because we don't harvest in the Georgia Strait, that this lack of relationship implies that the Georgia Strait has a carrying capacity for producing coho. And it's, it's very low carrying capacity for coho. What this says is that if you uh, tried to increase coho escapements or abundance by putting in hatcheries, it wouldn't do any good because you can't increase the carrying capacity. If you stop fisheries, it won't do any good because you can't increase carrying capacity. Well, They have some other indices that indicate some positive relationship, but mostly this idea that more juveniles in the fall does not mean more fish coming back the next year. Well, th this is what we call an errors and variables statistical blunder. 
The uh, juvenile abundance index is not an index at all for the total escapement. This, these index values are measured with high random error from year to year because a year to year variation in the uh, dispersal migration and early survival patterns of juvenile coho. Right, so they're not an indication at all of how many juveniles actually are contributing to this escapement. Whenever you regress a dependent variable on something that's not actually driving the dependent variable, when it's something measured with high error, you get this appearance that there's no relationship. So you get, in this case, that appearance of no relationship uh, is completely misinterpreted as evidence that the dependent variable doesn't respond to the independent variable. The reality is the index is measured with so much error, you have no idea whether there's a positive relationship at all in the data. It's the data that are screwed up on the x-axis. So never do a statistical regression where the independent variable is measured with, known to be measured with large statistical error. You'll always get this kind of garbage result. That's one aspect of that study that bothers me. The second aspect of it is that it focused entirely on and had absolutely no discussion of any of the data from the Georgia Strait prior to 2002. So they focused entirely on variation that occurred within this period after the collapse. They don't admit that the Georgia Strait 20 years earlier had been apparently capable of sustaining 10 times the number of juveniles long enough to contribute to fisheries the next year. So their assertion, if this is the carrying capacity of the Georgia Strait today, is that the Georgia Strait's carrying capacity for salmon has declined by 90%. Well, there's absolutely no possibility based on any measurements we have of food availability or anything else about the Georgia Strait. There's no possibility that the Georgia Strait is incapable of sustaining uh, at least five to 10 times as many salmon as it does today. There's plenty of food there's, and so on to have a large salmon abundance again. This kind of analysis of a short period of data like this and complete drawn complete in conclusions, wrong conclusions from it is a really good example of what Daniel Pauly has called the shifting baseline syndrome. Anytime you analyze a short period of data like this, you're gonna get a completely misrepresentative picture about the capabilities of that system that you can only see from taking a longer historical perspective on the system and its dynamics. Uh, well, I'll mention just one other example here, just to show you that you can never be sure what the hell is going on out there. There is one Chinook stock in the Georgia Strait, the Cowichan River on the south end of Vancouver Island near Victoria, that bucked the trend. So while, while all the other Chinook stocks have shown relatively poor survival and consistently low survival from coat of water tagging, the Cowichan stock showed a collapse in survival and spawning numbers up until the mid 2000s. And then the Cowichan stock turned around and has built back up to uh, almost kind of recent historical peaks. Its marine survival rate improved co correspondingly over that period. Even not quite enough to explain all of this increase, but most of it. Well, smolt numbers have gone up in the Cowichan system because of uh, some habitat improvements as well. And that's contributed to some of this, but most of the spawning stock increases, marine survival improvement that wasn't reflected in the other Georgia Strait stocks. So we have no idea why one of the main contributors to the Georgia Strait system is just completely bucking the trend shown by the others. Uh, one, uh, one possibility about this is that uh, transient killer whale sightings in the Georgia Strait increased dramatically around 2008. 
and remained high since then. Transient killer whales uh, are feeding primarily in the southern end of the Georgia Strait. They come in through the Juan de Fuca uh, to forage during the summertime. And um, that foraging is concentrated in the southern strait area uh, where the cowichan fish are also concentrated. Transient killer whales also have this really interesting behavior that was discovered back in the 1990s where one of their foraging modes is uh, to swim along close to shore and deliberately search for uh, juvenile seals that they target. And that disappears actually to be training behavior that always seems to be associated with uh, mother transients with their juveniles. And they're teaching, the, they're teaching the juveniles how to hunt for marine mammals uh, by teaching them to chase baby seals. And in fact, transient killer whale consumption rates based on our estimates of transient abundance are uh, enough to account for a pretty high proportion of the total juvenile seal deaths in the, in the Georgia Strait. So it could be, and, and the other thing is we've seen is uh, more in Puget Sound actually, is when the transients appear, the seals radically restrict their foraging activity. When there's no predators around, they forage out 10, 5, 10, 15 kilometers out from their haul out areas every day. So they'll sit on their haul out and then they'll swim out 5, 10 miles or kilometers and then they'll forage around in an area and go back to the haul out. When there's transients around, the seals stay right in close to the haul outs and spend more time hauled out. And it could be that in that southern Gulf area that uh, transient killer whales are to some degree at least, protecting the uh, Cowich and Chinooks from pr uh, predation risk. You know, just speculation, we don't know, but it's one possibility. Okay, did I have anything else? Nah, I'm not gonna cover that one. That finishes it. This finishes a, a somewhat long and complicated talk. So let, let's talk about this. Let's have some questions and stuff. Should I leave the screen sharing on if I need to go back to a slide, Murdoch, or how shall we do this? Yeah, thanks, Carl, uh, for a really informative talk. Um, yes, please leave your slides uh, up because uh, I'm sure there'll be some people wanting to refer to some of them. So uh, could yeah, people just feel free to ask questions either in chat or just raise your hand or just speak up. Who'd like to go first? questions, comments, especially students in, in the Fish 520 class, you must have some burning questions. Before there's any, any questions allowed, about the third person down in your, uh, in your Zoom list of people is Rob Bison. I should have uh, mentioned Rob's work. Rob's been working on impacts of uh, pinnipeds and other things on steelhead in BC, an iconic species uh, he's been working on through much of his career. And it's drawn similar conclusions about steelhead to what we have for coho salmon that the uh, major collapse of Fraser River steelhead populations has quite likely been due to uh, seal predation. Okay, now, sorry to take the time there. I just had to mention because I saw him in the list. Hmm. Okay, in the chat, there's a question. Um, uh, would you like to speak up and ask a question? Uh, see in the chat there. Do, do I have a chat? Oh, okay. okay, so so what's the difference between BC and the Columbia River management? Uh, there's a question, oh, is it a political okay. move like Columbia River? There is an active uh, uh, removal of trouble sea lines. Uh, let me first answer Billy's question that's above it. Uh, Lincod collapsed before the, uh, during the 50s before the before the sea lion and seal, before the seal build up in the Georgia Strait. Uh, Murdoch has been involved in an analysis of yellow eye rockfish. Well, it's one of the threatened rockfish species along the coast. And the uh, stock assessment analysis that Murdoch and others did, including Peter Elisiak, indicated that, uh, that uh, marine mammal predation has been one of the main reasons to at least prevent the recovery of that, uh, of that uh, rockfish stock. I didn't mention it in the list. 
Okay. Come on, Todd. It, it, it's overfishing defined. contributed to these two. O overfishing was definitely part of the problem with, uh, with, you with had one eye rock fish. It's just because you only had one example, link or two. Uh, yeah, by golly, you know, you're right. You're right. We do think the Lincoln collapse was due to overfishing. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. I'm sorry. I forgot. I should know this because it was my grad student, Steve Martell, who did the first major Lincoln stock assessment and showed that it was very likely overfishing that caused it to collapse in the first place. Yeah. Okay. What's the difference between BC and the Columbia management? I don't quite understand that. Uh, political move? Of, oh, well, I guess you're asking, they're doing some active control of pinnipeds in the Columbia River. So why, why are they doing uh, killing sea lions in the Columbia and so on? We're not here in BC. I think the, probably one key difference there is that uh, the uh, predation impacts on some uh, on some Columbia River stocks in particular locations below dams and so on. The sea lions fall on the the uh, the salmon up the river and then chomping on them is highly visible, easily recognized, and easily quantified. They're also counting fish up into the Columbia through the. Uh, through the Bonneville Dam system and so on. So they know how many fish, what proportion of the stocks are being eaten by pinnipeds. And they've also got a bunch of endangered uh, Chinook stocks and so on that, uh, that they really want to minimize predation mortality, every mortality rate on is, uh, that they possibly can. But that's, that's the only thing I can think of is why they've been a little more willing to entertain at least some selective calling. Well, did that answer your question? Whoever that was? I don't Earth? know the name, Earth. Yeah. Uh, maybe somebody okay. from sports fishing or commercial group, not sure. Okay, Joy. Yeah, I, I was wondering if what the scientific, if there is a scientific difference between uh, your analysis and the analysis of other people who are saying that pinnipeds um, are an issue uh, with uh, Andrew Trite. Uh, he is now all over Facebook on a campaign to prevent the um, uh, prevent any kind of reduction in seals. So I was wondering what the uh, what the scientific difference is. Um, it's not a scientific difference. He's been a co-author on some of this work and his graduate students have been major contributors to the data analysis that we've done. Uh, what you're what you're looking at is a person whose uh, policy recommendations are driven by his values, not his science. Yeah, what one of the other things that Andrew does, Andrew doesn't disagree about the science, as far as I know. Well, except one thing that raised, one thing that Andrew raised is uh, there was some old work showing with ecosystem modeling that uh, was called a vampires in the basement problem. That if we knock down uh, marine mammals, we might get buildups in populations that we don't want to build up that would impact the ones we value. And there was one model in particular that Andrew was involved with for, uh, <clears throat> for the Georgia Strait where knocking down the pinnipeds caused a huge outburst of hake. And those hake in the model ate all the herring and ate all the salmon out of the model. It was just a stupid calculation. Well, we know that that kind of argument is utter, utter nonsense. The Georgia Strait uh, sustained uh, healthy salmon fisheries over 60 years while pinniped abundances were low. And there wasn't any such uh, vampire like hake coming out of the basement over that 60 year period. And we don't expect it would occur in the future. But Andrew has used that argument, but uh, I think you're really looking at a value-driven argument, not a science-driven argument. It's one of these examples where a person uses their authority as a respected science to promote their values, whether or not it's supported by their own science. And this is a case where his values, and uh, he's saying we should value pinnipeds more than fisheries. 
And that's perfectly okay for him to do. It would just be more honest if he says, because I love marine mammals, than because uh, we have no evidence that their impact are severe. So one other argument that Andrew has been known to raise is, is that, uh, oh, that's food for transient killer whales. You knock down the seals and sea lions, you're gonna hurt uh, another killer whale uh, that, that's not doing too badly now. On, uh, but I, I think Carl, you've done some analysis of that too. Yeah, what happened was that uh, uh, the transient killer whale, there's been quite an analysis of the history of, uh, of the transient killer whale population along the BC coast. And uh, based on mark recapture estimates from known individuals, uh, John Ford has estimated how the transient population changed from the early 70s up to the 2010 or so. And what he showed was that the transient killer whale population build up in BC at the same time as the uh, seal and sea lion population recoveries. An interesting point though, is that the transient population estimates go up at about the same population growth rate as the seal population, the sea lion population, about six to 8% per year population growth rate. Well, transient killer whales or any killer whale population can't grow that fast. Their demography, their birth intervals, their longevity doesn't permit a population growth rate of more than about 4% per year. So what we were seeing over the 70s to into the 90s was transient, more of the coastwide transient population using the British Columbia coast. And then most recently, the inside waters of the British Columbia coast in particular. So we're seeing a substantial redistribution of, uh, stellar, uh, of, of transient killer whales in response to these marine mammal changes. But that is not evidence at all that reducing the marine mammal abundances in any one area would have any impact on those transients at all because they have, they are tra transient killer whales forage all the way from California to Alaska, right? Individuals that, that are spend much of their time in the Georgia Strait are also found down in California and up in Alaska at different times a year. So it's very likely with that very broad prey resource base that they're pursuing uh, with everything from California sea lions to porpoises and dolphins and even whales that uh, they won't see a substantial change at all in their prey resource base or their sustainable population sizes if we kill some seals and sea lions in BC. We are reducing their overall resource base by a small percentage, in other words. We just won't see them foraging around in the Georgia Strait, which is kind of fun to see. And I guess if you really value seeing if you value seeing transient killer whales more than you value fisheries, then you'd probably say that's worth, worth having. And there are certainly people who do. So there's another question in the chat. Do you want to address that? Um, looking at Steelhead again. Rob Bison might be able to answer that better. Where, where am I, why am I so not? Is there a correlation between the decline in Fraser and Thompson Steelhead and also now Skeena Steelhead? and the abundance of pinnipeds. Is there a correlation? Maybe Rob Bison would like to speak with, to that one because he's ex intensively looked at that. Rob? Yeah, Rob, have you looked at the Skeena data? I haven't looked at it recently. Well, we've seen uh, we've seen about a decline in Skeena over the last dozen years or so. Um, uh, and I have, I have, I'm not familiar enough with the pinniped data uh, along the North Coast uh, to be able to comment much about it, but uh, for Thompson Steelhead, it's uh, the um, the the sort of the covariate models that are most strongly strongly supported um, are those that include um, uh, seal abundance or seal and sea lion abundance as covariates to the to the um, Thompson and Chilcotin stock recruit models that we've examined. Mm -hmm. Now, I think the bottom line here is that I don't think we'd venture to guess about what's going on up in the in the in the Skeena. The Skeena steelhead stock has shown some kind of long period ups and downs over the years. Uh, they aren't, don't seem to be correlated with much of anything that we know about. Um, certainly not well correlated with uh, 
with impacts of commercial fishing and so on. Their recruitment rates have, have shown these kind of periodic changes up on the Skeena. But I, I, you know, I have, won't, won't, won't venture into any other guesses. So CPAX, uh, Templeton, uh, one of the grad students in Fish 520, you got a question, wanna okay. speak up? Hey Carl, um, that was super interesting. I was just curious, um, I just moved down here from Alaska, which has hooligan runs, which has just made me think about it. And I was wondering if you had a theory why the sea lion populations that far north were declining so much when these are booming. <laughs> the, uh, the Gulf of, I don't think the Gulf of Alaska, so the southern, southeastern part of the stellar sea lion population, I don't think has declined. I think it's increasing like ours. The, the big stellar sea lion decrease was in the Bering Sea in the Lucian okay. area. And that occurred quite a, quite a, quite a while ago. <clears throat> I can't imagine that <clears throat> oolikans were ever a substantial part of the diets or, or resource base of that stellar population. That, uh, <clears throat> that Bering Sea decline has never been explained. There's a paper just coming out now uh, are arguing that it uh, it had to do with the development of the uh, of the uh, uh, Bering Sea pollock fishery, but earlier analyses of that say no, there's no way that uh, that the pollock fishery ever reduced the pollock stock enough to have caused the sea lions such problems. But the counter argument to that is that that's coming out in this new paper is that. Uh, fishing itself uh, impacts sea lion behavior. So just having uh, fishing boats there targeting pollock in the times and places where sea lions forage on them could be interfering with sea lion foraging behavior. And there's also some, it's actually kind of non-public information suggesting that what really did in this, uh, the Bering Sea Sea Lion stock was probably uh, king crab fishermen who were shooting them. I was kind of wondering they, that. <laughs> yeah, the, the stellars were, were known or thought to go up and bite the floats on the big crab traps. And uh, you bite the float and the trap sinks and the guy loses his crabs and $6,000 traps. So there was some pretty merciless uh, blasting away with rifles off of those crab boats for a long period of time. I wouldn't be surprised if it doesn't continue to this day. <laughs> yeah, especially if you're a fan of uh, Deadly as catching a couple of characters on that show. <laughs> yeah, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting that uh, you have much lower seal densities in Alaska than we do down in BC, just in general. And uh, you have much, much higher survival rates of coho and Chinook than we do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think there's a lot more kind of informal control, predator control going on in all the Alaska coastal communities than there has been along the BC coast. So I, I guess what that kind of makes me think of is just like that they're kind of already doing the biological experiment that you're discussing of culling right. sea lion populations to see the effect on the populations of fish. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, you know, that's a spatial comparison we might want to make more of. Uh, is the, the way Alaskan uh, Chinook and Coho populations have uh, thrived over this period when the others are declining. And that is one striking difference is, uh, is the much lower abundance per unit area of, uh, of pinnipeds up in Alaska. Thank you. The, the uh, average marine survival rates of coho from Alaskan hatcheries is only about 25%. That's the survival rates we were seeing in the Georgia Strait when coda wire tagging was first started and when uh, seal populations were down around the same densities that you have along the Alaskan coast. Joy, uh, I hate Alaska. Another question? The Alaskans <laughs> always seem to be ahead of everybody else. Smart management. Joy, you had another question. Go ahead. 
Um, I guess my hand, I never took my hand down, but I, I do have another question and it's on Ursa's question. Ursa's um, sports fish advisory rep from, um, from uh, Haida Gwaii. And uh, um, I was, uh, he probably has a question the same as I do about, uh, have there been studies on seal populations on the North coast? I, I know that when we did that insert project years and years ago, that I thought somebody was supposed to be looking at steel, uh, not steelhead, pop, uh, pinniped populations on the North coast. I thought somebody was particularly gonna look at seal populations on the Skeena and Nass. And I know that um, Andrew had done some work on populations on Haida Gwaii, uh, but, but I don't know where to look for that information and if it has ever yeah. been updated or if it's years old now. Yeah, there, uh, there, there are certainly sea lion census data from, I think the last census was that Peter Alicia reported was 2017 and there's another coastwide census that's gone on uh, that uh, the sea lion census is coastwide. The seal census, uh, when Elisiak was doing it, he would go up the coast to a couple areas uh, every several years and do partial censuses. Uh, I think so. There's some there's some partial census data in his reports for particularly around the Rupert area, showing us a much slower buildup in those northern areas seal and sea lion buildups than in the south coast area. Uh, DFO just uh, has completed uh, uh, a couple of years ago a, a coastwide uh, seal and sea lion survey. Uh, they still haven't uh, released the technical reports summarizing the findings of that survey. Uh, the DFO scientist who you would could contact and ask if she can release information to you is uh, Sheena Majewski in Nanaimo. Uh, let me type that in the message thing if you want. There's, there's been a, yeah, we're not, it used to be we request data from DFO and so on, and they were very open about providing it. And that, uh, like Sheena had sent, me, sent us for the uh, Salish Sea Marine Survival Project, she sent us all of the raw census counts for seals over the whole history of the Georgia Strait Census Program back in the early 70s, doing a lot of spatial analyses of fallout distributions and how to do surveys more cheaply and things like that. But that uh, those doors have closed to us. I uh, don't know what's going on. So Bob Hooten has a question. Okay, is that the one in the chat or is this? Yeah, Bob can speak okay. up here. Yeah, can you hear me, Carl? Yeah, I see. Okay, How well, do you explain the relative stability of the Coca-Cola stock to the IFS scenario or IFS? Why does no one ever begin to quantify the in-river gillnet harvest to all the interior Fraser stock? Eh? How do you explain the catastrophic decline in Chilcote and Steelhead in just the past couple of years when pinnipeds show no evidence of increasing? I don't. I don't try. You wanted to ask maybe that Rob Bison that question. I've done that a number of times. Mm -hmm. Oh, right here, Bob. So the general pattern I, the, the, the race to this question is that um, early summer run steelhead populations seem to have held up better in places that we've measured them. And the steelhead populations that have declined the most are the winter runs and the, um, uh, and the interior summer runs in the Fraser. Now, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, we've quantified fishing over a long time frame, a very, fairly long time frame on IFS. And as, as best we can tell, the point in time when uh, a decline in productivity or a decline in steelhead survival collides with um, uh, fishing that you would classify as overfishing occurs uh, around the 2016 fishing season. So it's not that long ago, actually, relative to the time frame that we monitored. So, uh, so. It, it, the, the, the early summer run populations have generally held up better, uh, but, um, but, uh, 
but uh, so so it, I mean, potentially it could be a combination of things of 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 uh, interior phase of steelhead being more vulnerable to predation and also being uh, more vulnerable to fishing because of virtue of their run timing. Mm -hmm. Whereas the early run stocks are just are, uh, maybe are less exposed to both those factors. Just because of let, let, me, let me set a bit of context for just the, the students in the class about what uh, Bob's trying to get at and Rob's also mentioning is that uh, for a long time we thought that the Fraser River gillnet fishery was having a really severe impact on Fraser River steelhead. When the gillnet uh, fishery operated every year, it operated into the river going up as far as Mission and a lot of steelhead were intercepted, they were even sold commercially. But over the past, uh, since the early 90s, when I showed you that big drop in the exploitation rates of the uh, Fraser River sockeye, that uh, the in-river uh, commercial fishery has been radically curtailed. Uh, in-river commercial uh, 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 gillnet openings have been you know, once every four years kind of things. But what hasn't been curtailed is a, a, a developing uh, gillnet fishery that operates from Mission up to Hope uh, by First Nations people. Uh, it's a really touchy political thing. Uh, some of it is pretty efficient drift gillnets. Some of it is lots and lots of small gillnets tied up on shore and easy to hide. So it's really, really difficult to enforce uh, fishery closures on them. They're not targeting steelhead, they're, char they're targeting uh, sockeye pink chum salmon. Uh, most, I guess, chum. Uh, but it, it, it's just a really, really nasty situation for, from a political perspective and science perspective. The data are poor. Nobody likes to talk about it because nobody wants to interfere with First Nations fishing any more than they have to for all the reasons we don't want to, you know, reconciliation and so on. We don't want to interfere with First Nations generally. Uh, but I think, uh, yeah, the lack of data and uh, difficulties in interpreting some of the steelhead declines uh, arise from that, that horrific situation there. That, that's my point exactly, Carl. And, uh, yeah. You know, it's not. Yeah, yeah. It, no, it's a, it, the in river commercial fishery is is a non factor in my estimation. I mean, it's been you know regulated yeah, all the time. It's uh, that's the it's the First Nations fishery. Yeah, and it, and it goes far beyond hope. It's way up the main stem Fraser and through the canyon and beyond. You know, I've yeah. got lots of yeah. information from the retired top cop of DFO from his personal experiences. In yeah. That no, I mean, and I, I, I've drifted down the river during a close time duck hunting and uh, you know, seen like 50 or 60 nets in, uh, in, a, in a five mile drift down from Harrison Bay. You know, there's no question at all. That there's, and that, that, that's back 20 years ago. There, that there's some pretty intense mortality risk in that region. So, but I'm not going to go there. Anyway, I, I think we've run, almost run out of time here. <laughs> Any, any other quick questions from any students in the class? We'll give you one last chance. Can I just ask one question? Uh, this is no, regarding Murdoch, the you're diet. you're not a student yeah. in the class. But on their behalf, but uh, uh, one piece of data that you know, is used in analysis is, is the diet information. And we know that Peter Elisiak had presented quite a bit of diet data in a workshop 2018 near UBC. And he said he wasn't able to pu publish that. And it was uh, really uh, eye opener because he was, he was a, this, this shows that there, there really are some potentially huge impacts of sea lion predation on the adults and sub adults. Uh, it, it'd be so useful to get those. Do you know the status of, of that? And can you say something about the usefulness of, of no, Peter had information? another one back in 2012, a uh, CSAS science document that never saw the light of day. Also, the same sort of thing, mostly uh, uh, calculating feeding rates and uh, correcting estimates of feeding rates and, and diet composition data. Uh, 
the, I don't know what's going on there. I think, you know, the, I think they're trying to bury his research, to be quite honest. They been goodness knows in DFO. And they're using the uh, CSAS review process with all of its uh, difficulties as a, as a way of doing that. Okay, so uh, yeah, any other questions? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, you know, there's, uh, there's you know, I, I shouldn't comment about this, but uh, active opposition to doing pinniped analyses and, and finding pinniped impacts from within DFO it goes beyond just people going to meetings and not wanting to talk about it. There's some, there's some pretty questionable stuff going on in the way they're doing their science reviews and in uh, reviewing scientific paper submissions and things. All right, last chance to ask a question. You can always email or I guess uh, yeah, email up uh, Carl. I'm sure he'll be happy to entertain you. Um, he has lots of time on his hands now that he's retired. Um, Good morning, it's Ed George here, um, BC Wildlife Federation representative and SFAB member. Um, I did put a question on the table to do with the juvenile sturgeon in the lower Fraser um, with a with a view to pinniped oh. predation on them. I wondered if, if uh, Dr. Walters could respond to that. No, I, I see your paper here. Uh, there is no pinniped monitoring within the Fraser River. There's uh, anecdotal arguments from fishermen who are out on the river and so on that they're seeing uh, more and more uh, California sea lions, particularly, but also stellars way up in the river, up in uh, above Mission and in the area where uh, those uh, declines in uh, in uh, apparent abundance of, uh, of juvenile sturgeon have been occurring. Uh, but the other, the other big things going on there, the one we were just talking about is that uh, the, the juvenile sturgeon population that you're talking about is the ones that are big enough to get into a, a test gill nets. So they're, they're like five to 10 year old juvenile sturgeons. Uh, they're not the, the one or two year old babies. Uh, there's this, issue about whether it could be the uh, the First Nations fishery, gillnet fishery, that's what's, uh, what's doing in the juvenile sturgeon survival rate. Uh, I do recognize we, that. We and thank know. you for your comment. Um, yeah, it, it's- But I do it's, see, it's, it's, I, it's, I fish that area regularly and I quite enjoy it myself. Yeah. Um, but when, uh, Sockeye and Chinook are listed on Craigslist as caught nightly in the uh, Hope area. We know whose fishery that is, and it's not a legal one. That's right. Yeah. Well, that's Thank a, you. I won't, wouldn't try to defend any of this. But, you know, I, I worked on sturgeon for a while back when, and that, that decline is worrisome. It's unexplained. Uh, there's a couple of possible causes out there. Uh, and both of them involve predators. One, one bunch of natural predators going up there chasing salmon and some people predators, yeah. Okay, let me check down here, I'm not moving. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, I just skipped past your question there by accident, uh, Mr. George. I didn't mean to do so. I. I I, I'm not used to using this chat window. Hmm. Yes, yeah, sorry. You I do that. thank you for your response. Ah, you're most welcome. I, uh, I think I'm a Wildlife Federation. I know I'm not a Wildlife Federation. Used to be, used to be a member. One of the big problems in this whole thing, Mr. George, is that uh, the same kind of mentality that's generating opposition to uh, pinniped reductions through either commercial harvesting or culling 
It's the same kind of mentality that's making it a nightmare for those of us who like to hunt. And yes, I recognize that. It's a huge that. urban I'm... population that, that doesn't want us to be there at all. Yes, I, I'm a friend of Ken Pierce, so. Oh, yeah, there you go. Well, I'm not anymore because Ken won't get vaccinated then. We'll just shoot him then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. Well, opening day of pheasant hunting on Westham in a couple of weeks, Ken and I will be out there next to each other. <sighs> hey, just back Good. to the uh, recruitment issue on uh, Fraser River Sturgeon, uh, it would appear that the uh, decline in recruitment happened after the harbor seal abundance uh, stabilized. Like the, I think harbor seal abundance stabilized in the Strait of Georgia in the 1990s, whereas that decline happened in the early 90s and into the early 2000s. So at least that doesn't like it, it a lot depends on what's happening locally but in terms of the overall strait of georgia pattern of change in abundance of seals it, it doesn't seem to cor correlate with the uh, increase in at uh, the time of the uh, uh, say decrease in in survival or decrease in recruitment of the uh, sturgeon but that you know it's certainly uh, worthwhile looking carefully at that but the, the, the stellar mm -hmm. sea line impact uh, like carl didn't mention this issue of uh, too much of, of the california sea lines i, I think commercial fishermen can report that, yeah, there's uh, very large numbers of California sea lions. Uh, they've been showing up uh, in a really big numbers in the thousands in the last decade. They actually weren't in BC waters at all uh, prior to about 1980. There, there was absolutely none, no no California sea lions migrating, migrating. but uh, you know, after that, there's been maybe 2,000 a year, and then it's up to several thousand a year, uh, mostly males coming up in, in the wintertime, uh, to, and, and they actually are going after herring. Pacific carrying in the Strait of Georgia when they're spawning. And, and ulicans. They're a big part of the ulican targeting population now. Have been actually since they, when they first appeared here in BC in, in countable numbers, and Alicia was commenting about them, it was at the Fraser River Mound during the ulican run. Yeah. California sea lions all breed off the Farallon Islands down in California. The whole mature population is down there in the, in the summertime. They only come up here in the winter. So it, it's, you know, this, that seasonal impact is, uh, it, it's been difficult to monitor. All right, just... Yeah, the point that Murdoch made there. Are, are you still screen sharing, Murdoch? Uh, yep. Yeah. You're. you're the, part this of my is the relationship between coho marine mortality and uh, seal abundance. And what you see here is what Murdoch says is that uh, <clears throat> there was a, an apparent increase in mortality rate of coho after the seal population stabilized. But when you, uh, when you look at this in the fullness of time, it's not that far out of line with the prediction uh, overall for that overall period. So there's some decline here that doesn't seem to be, ex uh, mortality rates higher than expected from the, uh, from the regression line. Peter Elisek had indicated that uh, the uh, pre uh, diet uh, of Stella sea lions included maybe five to 10% coho and, and Chinook salmon. And uh, Stella sea lines, uh, let's say through the, uh, tw let's say even as uh, as late as the 2013 or 2017 census had been increasing exponentially in BC. So they were still going up. It's really uh, important to take a look at the data from the most recent census, but it, uh, we're not allowed to look at that. So we, we just don't know. Um, yeah. And those colonies, uh, colonies that actually had, or had been, uh, let's say, uh, had gone extinct, uh, Stella Sea Lion colonies that had gone extinct north of Vancouver Island up into Hackett Strait uh, in the, let's say, 1900s had been recolonized. And, and uh, so there's a, a very large expansion of these populations and they're actually now colonizing places they, they no longer had been. Nothing wrong with that. It's just uh, the potential for impact uh, on, on salmon and other species is, is uh, you know, much more serious. That's great. Yeah, they're much more spread out. Can kind of highly recommend to you uh, Peter Lisiuk's 2018 summary of all this, where he has this all in time series plots and maps and and so on. Uh, really, his 2010 seal 
report and that 2018 sea lion report are two of the most uh, remarkable scientific descriptive efforts that I've ever seen in fisheries. Okay. So are we done? I can go out and have a weed, get ready for my nap. Oh, Carl, I, I have one more question. Oh, uh, I'm fading Carl. fast, Joy. You'll have to hurry. Uh, well, I'll be very qu quick. I just wanted to know why is, um, is the Department of Fisheries using any kind of reliable uh, scientific argument when they say that uh, uh, they have to wait for more data? In or before they can have any kind of a fishery, because that's what they're telling us. Yep. No. <laughs> you know, as I said to you, if they just keep monitoring things and things just stay bad, as they're most likely to do, we still won't. We'll never know what was what was causing it. But the seals will stay abundant. Or I suppose we might get lucky, and the uh, transient killer whales might clobber the seals for us, but. You know, who's, who wants to wait and hope that that happens? But yeah, I mean, it, it, this is this thing I mentioned earlier that these guys have this excuse for inaction. We have to wait till we get more data. Scientists always say we got to wait till we get more data. You know, think about how that kind of goofball attitude has impacted us in the COVID outbreak where some of the medical scientists and so on have said, we have to wait, we can't act yet. We have to wait till we have more information. If they had acted earlier on things like vaccination and, uh, and rapid testing and so on, the COVID outbreaks would not have been anywhere near as severe as they have been, and there would not have been anywhere near as many deaths. So these uh, bureau medical ma management bureaucracies like the BC Center for Disease Controls have been practicing that same kind of game of let's wait, let's wait, we're not sure yet, let's wait. Uh, and we're all feeling the impact of it. Well, DFO, there's, there's no excuse for inaction in, in this case. Well, DFO is closing the commercial fishery. Um, mm. they, they, um, their announcements are tantamount to a closure. They stated they want to get rid of the gill nets entirely on the coast and keep maybe a handful of sains and a handful of trollers. And, um, you know, that that is in response to what they're calling a drastic decline in salmon stocks. And uh, they're not saying, of course, that it's, that it's our problem, but we are the solution. And then, you know, we keep saying once we're gone, <laughs> then maybe you'll, and you still have a problem once you're gone entirely, because our impacts are so tiny. The last three years, we've had no impact on any stock anywhere. Mm. So it, no, it, it, so Dr. Dr. Walters, it's Ed George again. Uh, I've got a reply for Joy there. Um, Joy, you, you are misinformed in that they are buying those licenses out to retire them. They're not removing them from the, uh, from the fishery at all. They're buying those licenses out to use them as barter in their uh, native treaty negotiations. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no way those licenses are going to disappear. They're just, they're just uh, it's, it's DFO baffle gab is what it is. Well, uh, this is a re licensed retirement program like happened during Mifflin. There might be reallocations to First Nations through court cases, but they, uh, right, the pick fee allocation, the pick fee license buyout was not a buyout for retirement. That buyout was for... This is not a buyout for retirement either. This is a buyout for uh, re relocation. They're going to take them up and use them in river. Well, that may be the that may be the end result, but those licenses will not be used in river. Uh, they might have a change in allocation uh, mm. for First Nations, but it won't be license-based. They're gonna be terminal fisheries under those licenses. Yeah, th this is something that they've been working towards for quite some time because it's easier for them to manage them, they think. And they've been some been working towards that in DFO even before there was any big offer thinking about trying to shift it back to First Nations ownership. Uh, you know, that's uh, so it goes. You know, some of this is driven also by this bonehead fisheries economics that 
says that it, it's a good idea to take out most of the commercial fishermen so that Jimmy Pattison can get a teeny bit richer owning half the seine licenses. You know, this is lunacy economics. These are the same guys that said, oh no, we have way too many gill netters on the Skeena because they're only making eight or $9,000 a year. Without the bonehead economists ever stopping to realize they were making eight or $9,000 a year for two months of work. So they were actually making real good wages and it was just part of their annual income portfolio for the people that were fishing. And it's actually a good income, they're doing real well. But the, the, you can see so you got the DFO economics branches, uh, people are also pushing towards this crazy extreme, getting rid of as many licenses as possible. And now on top of that, you've got this perfect storm of wanting to shift licenses into First Nations control. Uh, you know, it's, it's, to me, this is hugely irresponsible. I, 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 I cannot imagine how those people can sleep at night. How they can go home and sleep at night. Uh, I know some of those DFO management people and, uh, my God, it, yeah, how can you look at, how can you face your children? I guess the answer is they don't live in Rupert. Or if you they do, don't, they yeah. don't live in Campbell River. They don't live in Santula. They don't live in the places where, where these communities are suffering from uh, the declines. It's strangely on the East Coast, uh, like Troy will uh, be fully aware of this. There's a owner operator protection plan on the East Coast for New yeah. yeah, yeah. So the, they're, they're actually really putting in more stupid. protections. Yeah, they're putting in more protection yeah. for the owner operators. Um, and, and trying to re retain those people, you know, you, you got to fish your license. Mm -hmm. You can't have Jimmy Patterson fishing and leasing it for you, or owning it and leasing it. Uh, whereas on the West Coast, uh, it, it didn't. It, it's it stayed on the on the Atlantic. It, and uh, the question is, well, why why haven't they thought about something like that for for West Coast of of North America? You know, the we Canadian have absolutely side. complete policy divergence between yeah. Eastern and Western Canada right now. With Eastern Canada shifting back to uh, focus on uh, owner operator uh, license systems, on sustaining fishing communities to the extent they can still be sustained, and so on and so on. And on the West Coast, absolutely the opposite. This incredibly callous. Oh, shit. We got to stop. We got to end this conversation. <laughs> Carl's going to go have a weed. Oh, Joy, Joy wanted to say anything about that uh, different dichotomy, East Coast, West Coast. Do you know what's behind that? Politics. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, DFO ran two different experiments. They ran an open, open uh, owner operator experiment on the East Coast. And on, on this coast, they operated an experiment uh, where they wanted to see what would happen if you gave control to corporate uh, entities. <laughs> and so we had corporate concentration on this coast. And on the East Coast, there was. Mm. Uh, uh, protection of communities known and operators and that was that was during a time of, of um, uh, Romeo LeBlanc when those policies uh, were developed and owner operator was very important to him and his constituency on the east coast but on this coast uh, fisheries has never been important because we have too many too few MP seats in in the ridings up and down the coast so um, you know if we were in 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 um, if all of our MPs uh, represented writings uh, where, where we did stripes, horizontal stripes across the map of British Columbia and everybody had a little bit of the coast, then, then we would probably have a little bit more impact, but we don't, we have few coastal MPs. And Has there ever been a coastal a fisheries minister from the West Coast who wasn't from the, from the city? We had Wilkinson. Who? Wilkinson. Wilkinson. Was he was Nine there years. yeah, for a little while. Oh. North North Man, and, and prior to that, of course, there was John Fraser, and I don't know where he lived, but I suspect in the lower mainland, not nobody in the outside. Point Gray. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Carl, uh, for a really fantastic and informative talk. Uh, thanks, everybody, for contributing questions and comments. Uh, it's been a really great session.